am I? What do I do? So I run a research institute called Ready Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. Uh, it's a 10-year-old institute, and it's located inside what's now the second largest pediatric health system in the U.S. We're located in Southern California, uh, in Orange County and San Diego County. For the last 15 years, maybe a little bit less, we've been focused very hard on rapid and ultra-rapid genome sequencing. Ultra-rapid genome sequencing means a provisional report, diagnostic report, within 36 hours, and a final report in three days. And we do that primarily on children in intensive care units who likely have a genetic disease. As you know, there are over 10,000 severe childhood onset genetic diseases. And for these children, many of them have onset at birth. They go from the birthing suite straight into an intensive care unit, and a race is on to identify their causal variants in time to save their life, in time to get them life-saving treatment, or if there is none, to then counsel a family and make appropriate plans. So we do that to the scale of, last year it was about 1,300 families, and we do it not only for our system now, but for about 100 children's hospitals all around North America. What this means is that over the last decade or so, we've amassed many, many cases that we go back to Illumina with and say, short read sequencing couldn't solve this for us. Typically what they'll do is rerun them, go, yeah, you're right, and then they'll sick it on the Dragon team to come up with a custom bioinformatics solution. However, that's not always possible, and so when I found out about Constellation about a year ago, I was pretty darn excited because just imagine if you had the power of long reads in a short read platform, right? So you'd have a single platform that could cover your entire diagnostic enterprise. Because currently what we have to do is to support multiple bespoke assays for individual genes and individual variants that we are recurrent in our patients, and yet we know we won't detect them accurately with conventional short read sequencing. So I'm gonna be talking at 4.30 today. I have the super interesting patient story. It's about a little boy called Connor Dalby. So please show up and I'll introduce you to Connor and we'll walk through his story and bring some Kleenex, okay? Um, the other cool thing here is, right, I'm, I'm a 64-year-old CEO. I haven't made a sequencing library since 2009. That was the Illumina GA2 instrument. Now, back in those days, making a library took you a day. And um, it, it was a matter of faith. You couldn't see it. Um, and it was really, it was, it, there was a lot of finesse involved. Um, that's me a couple of weeks ago making a constellation library. So I got hands-on experience, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so you saw this plot before. What we're looking at here is hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is one of the commonest childhood genetic diseases in boys. It's X-linked. One in 5,000 boys will have hemophilia A. They have recurrent bleeding. They bleed into joints. They bleed into their brain. Obviously, it's a high priority to identify these children before they have a major bleed. For example, many of them come to light when they have a first dental extraction or a first surgery. That's not a good scenario at all. So we would love to be able to screen the entire population for this and thereby make sure that they get therapy and never experience a major bleed. There's a problem though, and that is that you can't pick up two of the most common variants that cause this disease. Why? Because they're large structural variants, and in particular, they are inversion variants. And those are just invisible on short read sequencing. So um, let me just tell you a little bit more. The gene is factor eight, it's X-linked, 26 exons, 186 kilobases. It's shown in the cartoon, so look at bottom, that side, far side, whatever side that is. You can see the gene there, right, the 26 exons. What you can see there in a little red bar is there's a repeat sequence called A1. You may not be able to see that from the back, but anyway, take it on faith that that is precisely duplicated way over downstream of the gene, about 300 kilobases 
away from the gene in A2 and A3. Do you see that? Now, what happens recurrently is homologous recombination during meiosis where you flip that. And it's a clean break, crisp break. Um, and what this means is the gene is disrupted. The gene is divided in half, and part of it's transcribed in one direction, part in the other direction. You have hemophilia. This accounts for 45% of hemophiliacs. So you can't pick this up. With constellation, what you can see on the far right is the commonest of those uh, variants. It's called the intron 22 inversion. And again, you may struggle to see this a little bit, but in that right-hand panel, that's the inversion, where the gene is inverted, and so some of the exons are now translocated 600 kilobases away from the others and expressed in the opposite orientation. Now, when we map the constellation reads, as you heard, we're mapping on one axis, reference genome, and on the other axis, patient genome. If you have a normal X chromosome, you look like the left panel with a perfect diagonal. The intensity color there, each of the dots is a read. We're looking at 700 KB. Uh, each of the dots is a read, and the intensity is a measure of the depth of coverage at each nucleotide position. Got it? Now, when you have an inversion, what you can see is very crisp delineation of the breakpoints down to the nucleotide resolution. And you can see the translocation of the mapping of the junction reads causing this bow tie phenomenon, which is easy even for me to pick up with my bare eye. And so we're showing two different mutations there. One is an inversion in uh, intron 22, and the other in intron 1. That's the middle panel. It's a smaller inversion. It accounts for about 5% of hemophilia A. So we got these from the National uh, Hemophilia Society. We've been chasing this uh, variant, or these set of variants, for a couple of years. Um, this, is a, this is a major gap right now in terms of our diagnostic completeness in cases. Um, so it's been a high priority for us. And so when we found out about this, we schlepped blindedly uh, 16 samples to Illumina, and they got them all right. So 16 out of 16, I think we have a solution now for hemophilia A. You can imagine the hemophilia community are pretty excited about this. Okay, this is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, okay? But I'm going to tell you a story, a patient story this afternoon. Here, I just want to spend a minute or two on a brief version talking about technology. The other major bugaboo uh, with short read sequencing is an inability to phase. And so... Typically, we sequence mom, dad, and baby, and thereby we're able to impute phase, right? And this is critical in recessive disease where you need two variants or a homozygous variant, and so we have to distinguish compound heterozygosity from having two variants in cis on the same haplotype, right? We have to phase to do that. Now, we can do that, but parents are not always available, and so this is a big, a big shortcoming. And we often have to essentially guesstimate and say we think this is diagnostic, but we're not sure because we can't phase. Phasing with short read sequencing is limited to maybe a, a kilobase, uh, a little bit more if you're lucky. With constellation, as you heard, you can routinely get megabase scale contigs. So phasing ought to be easy. Well, we put it to its paces and said, OK, let's see if that's possible. Now, this is a really interesting case. This is a little boy in whom we made, as part of a larger collaboration, an N of 1 therapy, an antisense oligonucleotide. The little boy's name is Connor. He's 14. And he suffers from developmental epileptic encephalopathy 11. The gene is SCN2A. It's a brain synaptic uh, voltage-gated sodium channel. And what you may not know about ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides, is often they don't actually target the mutation. They target a region of the gene because they're actually targeting pre-mRNA and causing RNSH to degrade that on the dysfunctional allele. So you re retain the function of the normal copy and the mRNA encoding the toxic copy, because these are primarily gain-of-function mutations, is destroyed and not expressed. Now, the reason why this is really tricky 
is these are all de novo patients, right? They don't inherit this. If you have this disease historically, in the absence of a therapy like an ASO, these patients would die before adulthood. So all of the variants are de novo. You're not going to get phase from parents. Now, in this case, Connor had an amazing response, I'll tell you about this afternoon, to his ASO. He gets it every three months. It's injected in intrathecally. And um, I'm not going to steal my own thunder. Uh, so show up. Or don't. You just missed the best talk of the, uh, of the conference. Um, anywho, because this particular ASO targets a reference region in an intron about 20 kilobases away from his causal mutation, we thought to ourselves, hmm, maybe this ASO could have a broader applicability. All we need is to have a situation where whatever the variant is in that gene is in cis with reference at the ASO location. And so again, we schlepped, we've now had, I think, 18 diagnoses of SCN2-associated epilepsies over the last decade. We schlepped those, or we're continuing to do so, to Illumina to say, okay, can you prove out the phase for these? We want to understand how common this scenario is. And I didn't mention this, but on the healthy allele at that location, the ASO location, Connor has a benign SNP. It's present in 25% of the population. That's why the ASO doesn't sit down to his healthy copy, right? So that's the scenario we're looking for. And the bottom line is it's working. Here's an example. So this is a traditional IGV view. We're looking at the SCN2A locus, or locus rather. You can see the exons and the introns. You can see where the pathogenic SNP is, and you can see where the ASO target is on chromosome 2. And what you can see here is that using constellation, we are able to provide phasing across the length of the gene. It's black and white, and we can immediately phase and say, yes, you may be ASO amenable, or you may not. The broader applicability, obviously, is this provides a solution for recessive disease that may obviate the need for parental samples. So last slide, and I'm out of time, I'm sorry. Um, if your CEO seems pretty worthless to you, <laughs> you can actually, with Constellation, get some productivity out of him. Just get a lab coat on him, shuffle him in his wheelchair down to the lab, and plug him in. Because I did it, and I fit the other criteria. It's literally 10 minutes. Uh, it's about five steps. And uh, hey, look at me. I'm really focused there. You can tell I haven't done this in a while, right? Don't mess with me. Um, what are the, what, why is that such a big deal? Well, we're facing now democratization of genome sequencing. We want to do this at population scale. We want to do it in every hospital. Uh, and that means there's going to be a substantial shortage of the workforce needed to be able to operate those instruments. Furthermore, the FDA, in terms of its regulatory capabilities, has very different rules for low complexity testing versus, or devices versus high complexity. Constellation makes this a very low complexity test. So that's going to be very interesting from a democratization standpoint. But the bit I'm really excited is it reestablishes uh, a short read genome as a fully comprehensive solution, we believe, for childhood genetic disease. Now, we haven't proven it for everything, but we've thrown a lot of tough cases at this. And so far, it was working for triplet repeat expansions. It's working for genes of pseudogenes. It's working for things like complex structural rearrangements. I'm pretty stoked. <laughs>